you turn your song books to 255, that will be a song we use as a song of encouragement at the end of our lesson today. 255. There is a reason that we can, with thanksgiving in our heart, in a very spirited fashion, sing the song that we just sang. At the same time, one of the purposes of our assembly together in a manner such as we are this morning is to point out that while it is possible for the totality of the human race to be happy in their pursuit of heaven above, not everybody enjoys the privilege of such happiness. It is reserved for certain individuals. Those who meet the criteria set forth by God, not by taking a public opinion poll and getting people to stand up behind us and say what a good guy I am, but based upon the authoritative word that God has provided for us. And at the same time, the purpose of our assembly together in Bible classes or assembly together to hear sermons from pulpit is to help us to be able to stand in an evil world because that is exactly what this world is. There is a God of this world, little G God, Satan. As a matter of fact, last week we pointed out the fact that it is indeed possible for Satan to get an advantage over us if we are ignorant of his devices. Now, if that was possible... For a congregation of God's people at Corinth, and it was, or Paul would not have been writing it. Don't you think that the same possibility would exist in the year 2011, say, in a congregation at Dunlap, or any other congregation in the world? And if indeed it is the case that Satan could get an advantage over those who are blood-bought, then he's already got those that ain't. And thus the need for everybody to stay on their toes so they don't begin and end in the wrong direction, obviously. When we talk about Satan's devices, the focus that we want to center on today is the fact that we must and we can know full well just exactly the strategies that are employed by Satan in his pursuit of our eternal damnation. I know that sounds pretty strong, but that's exactly the way it is. Because just as surely as God wants us saved eternally, Satan wants us damned eternally. He wants to be with us forever and ever. And if from a purely numerical standpoint, if we start to decide success based upon numbers, Satan is a way more successful in what he is out to do. Even Jesus would say that in Matthew chapter 7. Remember verse 13 of the Sermon on the Mount? He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there. At far straight is the gate, and there is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. I mean... I can see a difference, a real noticeable difference between many and few. And the Lord let us in on that significant fact. Is that because that's the way the Lord wants it? Or is that simply a statement of the reality that most people do not desire salvation through Jesus Christ to the extent that they will pay the price so that they can arrive safely in heaven one day? That's fact. It's not because it's outside the reach of anyone. It's that they simply fail to take advantage of what is freely offered. But, but think about this standpoint, too, because while we constantly have to be aware and, and constantly have to be striving to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God's will, if, in fact, it was the case that in the first century, when you've got apostles, when you've got prophets, when you've got direct lines from heaven inspired men that were going around preaching the gospel, and yet there were people who could properly be classified as ignorant. And remember how that we noted what we mean by that word ignorant. It's not a bad word. It is a word that aptly describes the situation that exists so many times. 
And when someone is ignorant of the devices of Satan, I am going to go out on a limb there that since Satan can get an advantage over us if we're ignorant of his devices, then we better not be ignorant of his devices, right? Because we certainly don't want to give him any more ability than he's already got. And if we do not know his devices, we do not know what's in his mind, we do not know how he works, then it seems to me that the wise course of action for us to follow is to become more aware and not be ignorant of his devices. Is it simply a lack of information? Have we spent our time, maybe better wasted our time, finding out a whole lot of stuff about a whole lot of stuff that don't matter? And all the while, we could have become more familiar with the way Satan works. We could be more familiar with the sustaining power of God and His Word that would allow us to overcome the devices of Satan. And sometimes there are people who fit into the category of being safe. S-A-F-E. That is, they are not accountable to God. They are not able to make rational decisions. They are mentally challenged. They are too young. Or they never will reach the point where they can sustain themselves intellectually and thus God will not hold them accountable in their unaccountable condition. At the same time, or too many times, people just don't know because they just don't want to know. They are ignorant by default, ignorant by ignoring the truth that is abundantly available. Now, let's think about that for a minute. I guarantee you, if we were to use examples of physical diseases and how to avoid certain physical diseases, then many people would begin at a very early age to get those ideas into the minds of their children so that their children do not end up going to an early grave because of contacting and contracting a disease that would kill them. Guaranteed. But, but what about a disease of a spiritual nature? One that is far worse than physical death. One that would result in an individual being lost eternally. Isn't that somewhat more terrible than physical death? Well, certainly it is. And thus, any time and every time that we can reinforce our understanding and come to a better understanding of God's will for our lives in order to be able to face the difficulties of life, then those are opportunities that we must jump at because we do not want to be ignorant of the devices of Satan and we don't want to be ignorant of the way that Satan works to accomplish his will. You remember this a few moments ago as Keith read from Acts chapter 20. Paul said that concerning these Ephesian elders that he had kept back nothing that was profitable unto them. Now, here's the amazing thing about things that are profitable. When you were going to school, there were things that you did not care to learn. But you know some of those things, even though you detested them, end up being profitable? That's right. And sometimes that's the way it works with sermons, with lessons. We may not see the impact that the principles would have in our lives, but in the long run, they certainly are profitable. And as it related to the church at Ephesus and these Ephesian elders, Paul said that he could honestly say that he was pure from the blood of every one of them. Why? Because he had not shunned to declare all the counsel of God. He kept back nothing that was profitable, And he had told them everything they needed to know. And thus, in a very real sense, there was nobody at Ephesus that could say, Paul, you didn't tell me that. 
Paul, you didn't let me in on that. Paul, why did you keep that a secret? Paul, why didn't you preach that to us? Paul, because he did. He did preach it to him. He did teach it to him. He did publicly and from house to house relay the information to them so that, get this, they could not and would not be ignorant because of him. Now, does that mean they still might be ignorant? Oh, well. Yeah, that's possible. So it wasn't going to be his fault because he simply did all that he could do to see to it that they were not unknowledgeable of the things that they needed to know. And that is a role that I take seriously as well. And one of the motivations for our lesson, even this morning. The lesson is entitled, Why We, and the word we there is collective and includes those that are members of the Lord's Church here at Dunlap. And that's what I'm talking about. Why we do not celebrate Easter as a religious holiday. And each one of those words in that title has significance. And I want us to give proper attention to each one of those words, okay? The word Easter is a word, of course, that did not originate in the United States of America. It is a word that has come to us from the Anglo-Saxon Esther or Estera, who was a spring goddess of those that ended up becoming Germans later on. And, incidentally, it was in the springtime, around April, that there were sacrifices that were offered to this goddess, Esther, and thus the name Easter. And, as might be expected, since it's the spring and since things are getting green and since there was fertility rites that was always associated with those heathen festivals. Someone says, you've got to be kidding me. Well, go back and read a little bit of heathen festivals and what was going on in the land of Canaan, and that's why God sent the children of Israel to wipe them out. That's fertility festivals. So we're not talking about something that's outside of the Scriptures relative to what goes on in parts of the world along the time of the spring. All right? The term Easter, someone says, is in my Bible. Well, that means that you have a King James Version of the Bible, which is a very excellent translation of the Scriptures, but that word is mistranslated in the King James Version of the Bible. In Acts chapter 12, verse 4, when you read the word Easter, rest assured that is not the original word in the Greek. The Greek word is Pascha. It's found 29 times in the New Testament. And every other time it is translated properly as Passover. But because of the influence of Roman Catholicism, even on King James, then Easter made its way into a good translation of the Scriptures. Easter Sunday, somebody says, man, he hit the nail on the head, didn't he? That is right, because that's what today is referred to as. Today is an annual religious holiday that is celebrated by multiplied millions of people. Because it's on this day that millions of people commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead on this day right here. Many people consider today to be the most holy of all religious holidays. If you was to ask people about it today, or if you was to read the, the paper, the local paper yesterday, then you would find all types of testimonials relative to these things right here. I'm not making this up. This is exactly the way it is, and you know that's the way it is. And for some people, this is the day each year when they attend religious services. Now, Christmas is a close second, but... If there's going to be any attendant of services at all, and you have to pick one, then most people, if they're going to pick one, will pick today, and then others will, of course, pick as well Christmas. There are many religious groups up and down this valley that are having Christmas programs, both previous to today 
and even today. There was Good Friday services that local groups had. There was sunrise services this morning. You could find out just exactly what time the sun was rising this morning. You could participate in that. There were plays or passion scenes, uh, crucifixion scenes, resurrection of the dead scenes, and all such as that. You've heard all about that. There are actually Easter cantatas that some religious groups have. Sometimes they'll offer the Lord's Supper today as well. And all types of decorations and all types of partying that go along with the celebration of Easter Sunday as the Resurrection Sunday of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, sometimes you have to let it be known right up front what you're not saying before you can actually say what you're saying, okay? We're not saying this at all because the members of these various religious groups that are doing these things are not good people. So the best friends I've got are people that are today celebrating uh, sunrise services and this afternoon participating in all these things as well. It's not because we don't like the people that are doing these things. That's not it at all. It's not that we have a personal preference for what we want to do and if anybody wants to be my friend then he's going to follow my personal preferences and since my personal preference is to not celebrate today as Resurrection Sunday then if you're going to be my friend you won't either. Now, that's not got anything to do with it. That's not the way we decide what we do in the religious realm. At least, it better not be what we decide to do. Here's the matter in a nutshell, friend. There is no authorization to observe the resurrection of Jesus Christ yearly. There's no authorization to yearly observe the resurrection of the Lord. And when I say there's no authority, I mean by that, I'm not talking about the United States of America, I'm talk, not talking about the Constitution, I'm not talking about the city laws of Dunlap, Tennessee, I'm talking about Bible authority. Bible authority is the very heart of this issue. And when it comes to, I mean, after all, this is the Lord's day, the first day of the week, then we have to have authority from the Lord if we're going to be doing what the Lord wants us to do. Say, for example, here was Jesus in conversation with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in John chapter 4. And she began to ask after he had got into her personal life to the extent that he found out and she knew that she was living with a man that wasn't her husband. She had had a whole bunch of husbands. She changed the attention of the focus to worship. He said, oh yeah, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, where's the proper place to worship? Us Samaritans say it's Mount Gerizim, and the Jews say it's Jerusalem. Which one's the right place? Well, Jesus followed her lead. He took the bull by the horns and said, well, you know, the Jews are correct in that matter. He said, but here's the thing. The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God's a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now here Jesus describes the type of worshiper that I want to be. Not the worshiper that passes some type of test from those that watch television. They determine what. No. Here is a test whereby we can make a determination based upon God's Word as to whether we are true worshipers or not. Because a true worshiper, according to the Lord Himself, is the one who worships the Father, is one who worships the Father in spirit, is one who worships the Father in truth. Now, obviously, the, the Father has to be the object of our worship. While there are people in the world who are deserving of our respect, the only one that's deserving of our worship is God. And God is deserving of us of Him being worshipped as well in spirit, that is, with a reverential attitude of respect and reverence for who He is and what He is, and in truth, which means according to God's Word, because God's Word is truth. Pretty simple. That's the type of worshiper that is a true worshiper. And that points to the very point of Bible authority. But notice also, in Colossians chapter 3, at verse 17, 
Paul says, And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, you do in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean, in the name of? If Barney Fife comes to your door and beats on your door and says, Open up in the name of the law, while you not, you're probably not scared of Barney Fife. You could probably whip him with one arm tied behind your back. He does possess authority as an arm of the law, but you better open your door. Because he's saying, Open up by the authority of the law. Well, that's the point here. Paul is saying, Whatever we do, and that would just sort of naturally proceed from a heart that is thankful for the salvation that they enjoy in Christ to be willing to do what the Lord says do. Whatever you do, do all by the authority of the Lord. And there again, the matter of authority is that which is established by the sacred Scriptures. Another passage in which we see a deviation from God's divine plan is in Second John, beginning at verse 9. John says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine hath both the Father and the Son. If any come to you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not in the house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Now notice the situation here. Here are individuals who are progressing past the doctrine of Christ. They are going onward and not staying with the doctrine of Christ. Now, what, Paul, what uh, John says by inspiration here is that when one does that, they forfeit their fellowship with the Father and they forfeit their fellowship with the Son. Let me ask you. If somebody forfeits their fellowship with the Father and forfeits their fellowship with the Son, and I seek to continue a maintaining a fellowship with them, what does that say about my attitude towards fellowship with the Father and the Son? It evidently comes secondary because of my desire to maintain fellowship outside of the fellowship that's available for the Father and the Son. That's why John would say, don't receive me, don't beat in God's feet. You are beating God's feet someone who is not in fellowship with God. Why would I want to aid and assist someone who is not in fellowship with God? And to stay in fellowship with God simply means to proceed in accordance with the truth. And in the absence of truth, you cannot proceed. Simple as that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. This question came up one time at Bible camp a number of years ago. And one young lady went so far as to make this statement. There is not authority for a church building and here you're going to tell us that we have to follow the Scriptures relative to our worship? What do you think that? Does the Bible authorize a church building? Where is that book, chapter, and verse that says, build a church building? Well, it's contained by implication right here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Listen to what Hebrew writer who I believe was the Paul said. Let us consider one another to provoke and to love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more you say they approach it. Somebody says, well, that's not there. All that says is don't forsake, forsake assembling yourselves together. That's it. Are we authorized to assemble ourselves together? Well, sure. If we're authorized to assemble ourselves together, not only authorized, are we demanded? Is it demanded of us that we assemble ourselves together? The answer is obviously. What are we going to do that? You see, the very fact that we are authorized to assemble together authorizes all that's necessary to assemble together, including the building, all the way down to, get this, folks, toilet paper. Yes, friend. If we do not respect God's authority to the extent that we follow His wishes and His will in this regard, then obviously we are trying to please somebody other than the Lord. There is no authority. Notice as well another principle, another point. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 through 10, remember that the Apostle Paul had a great difficulty dealing with Judaizing teachers, especially that were 
affecting Galatian brethren, and thus the reason for this epistle to the Galatians. And in the midst of his trying to help them see the error of their way, he says that they were observing days and months and years, and he said, I'm scared of you. I am fearful that I have wasted my time with y'all if y'all are going to continue to hold on to the things of the old law. Now, why was he fearful? That they were making a big deal out of days and months and years. Now, here's the interesting thing, and a point that I don't, I don't remember anybody else ever making. Were the days that these individuals were observing, were they at one time authorized days to observe? And the answer is, absolutely. They weren't. Where is the authority for the observance of a yearly commemoration of the resurrection of Christ from the dead? That's not even found. At least the days that these individuals who had been salvaged from Judaism were going back to were days that at one time had been authorized. That cannot be said for man-made holy days like Easter. Can't be done. And here's a simple question, just a, just a common sense question. And this is one that I've asked I don't know how many times, to which I've received very little response. Why do people get all excited to engage in that which is not authorized while refusing to do that which is clearly authorized? It makes no sense. They refuse to do that which they have the authority to do and want to do what they have no authority to do. Does not the Bible say that we are to commemorate the death of Christ every first day of the week? Well, sure. In Acts chapter 20, at verse 7, which we'll see in greater detail here in a minute. Well, what about this matter, anyhow, of holy days? Holy days. Now, think about it. If you are a person who makes references to the, quote-unquote, holy land, I wish you'd rethink that terminology. Why is a land holy? Well, it's holy right now because of many shells have landed and made me holy. And folks, that's the only way it is holy. It's Bible land, but holy land? Well, what about holy days? Folks, if you let people do your thinking for you, then your year is already laid out before you before you even begin it. The first day of the year is the holy day, Mary, Mother of God day. Ash Wednesday, Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, Divine Mercy Sunday, Ascension, Pentecost Sunday, Trinity Sunday, and that's not all. Trinity, well, I'm sorry, twice. Corpus Christi, thought that was a place in Texas, didn't you? Assumption of Mary Sunday, Holy Day. All Saints Day, Holy Day. First Sunday of Advent, Holy Day. Immaculate Conception, Holy Day. Christmas, Holy Day. Now, a simple request. Where is the Bible for any of that? And by Bible, I simply mean book, chapter, and verse. And by that, I mean show me a command, show me an example, or show me anywhere the implication follows that those are days that we should celebrate. Let me go back there, if you don't mind. Maybe I can't. The fact is, in Acts chapter 17 at verse 11, when Paul and Silas came into the city of Berea, the text reads, Now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures daily 
whether those things were so. Did you hear that? They searched the Scriptures to see if what Paul was teaching was so. And when they did that, they found out Paul was telling them the truth. If I never say it, and I do this often as I remember, that goes far here. Do not accept anything I say. Do not accept anything anybody in the pulpit says, except only that which the Bible teaches. And then we'll be all right. That's what the Brians did. The origin of all of those holy days, friends, without exception, that means there is no exception to any of them. Each one of them was invented by Roman Catholicism and not God. And what has happened is that Protestantism has adopted these holy days for themselves. Now, here's a question that I have to ask myself and a question that I want us to ask each other. Will we pay spiritual tribute to either Protestantism or Catholicism by celebrating any of these days, any of these weeks, any of these seasons, and notice this next phrase, in a religious way. So I said, Freddie, you mean, you mean your kids didn't hunt, get to hunt eggs? Oh, no wonder they're so hurt. Said, no wonder they look so fine. No, no, they hunted eggs. You mean your kids never did have any, any new clothes in the spring? Well, sometimes they did. My wife knew how to sew. But the fact is, friends, there's a far cry between doing those things that are customarily in the time of year and making a religious connection to them. Far different. Look at these passages of Scripture. Just look at the first one. I'll let you, let you go. In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now think about that. Be ready to give an answer. And the idea of an answer there is a reasonable explanation. Friends, here's a reasonable explanation. The reason why I do what I do is because the Bible authorizes in these particular places me to do that. The reason why I don't do this, that, or the other is because there is no authority from the Bible to do that. That's a reasonable explanation. A reasonable explanation is not, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. That's not a reasonable explanation. A reasonable explanation is not, well, as far back as I can remember, people in my family have been doing that. They make the same claim in Salt Lake City, Utah, for being Mormon. They make the same claim in Jerusalem for being Jews. They make the same claim in the middle of Saudi Arabia for being a Muslim. Good thing you weren't born there. Or you might be trying to fly a plane into one of our buildings right now. By failing to think, we've got to use the intellect that God has blessed us with to do His bidding. The origin of all of these religious holy days, I will respect those who do it. I will treat them with kindness. But I am not going to fail to try to enlighten them with the Scriptures so that they might do better. Because, friends, it comes down to this. They can know better, and they can do better, and that is the purpose of of shining as light in the world. If we're going to influence the world as salt and as light, then we simply cannot blend in. We have to be distinctive as God's Word demands that we be. Did you know that Jesus even warned about human traditions? The scribes and the Pharisees knew full well that one of the Ten Commandments was honor your father and your mother. But what they did with honor your father and mother is terrible. They said, if you would commit your estate to the upkeep of the temple, 
then you could put your parents out on the street and make them beg. Now, who would support anything like that? How about people that's getting paid from what comes into the temple? They did. And then those are the very ones that would get upset with Jesus and his disciples eating without washing their hands? Same fellow. What were they guilty of doing? They were making their traditions necessary for everybody else to observe. And by so doing, they were setting aside the commandments of God to keep their traditions. There's no spiritual connection between a colored egg, an Easter lily, and a whole lot of other things that we do, not religiously, but we do because of the society in which we live. Faithful children of God reflect upon the Savior's resurrection of the dead every first day of the week. As we gather together to worship God in the regular assembly of the Lord's church. Friends, God has a simple plan. It involves hearing the right thing because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Upon hearing it, believe it. Believe inclusive of the fact that Jesus Christ is who He claimed to be, the Son of God. Be willing to repent of your sins, to confess your faith with your mouth before an audience such as the one assembled here today so that you might then be properly baptized into Christ as a penitent, believing, confessor for the forgiveness of your sins so that the Lord might add you to His church. Might be in times past, that's just exactly what you did. Remain faithful if that be the case through being faithful to the point that you give your life for the cause of Christ by walking in the light, by abounding in the work of the Lord. And whatever comes our way, let us not ever, ever, ever be weary in well-doing because in due season, we shall reap, if we faint not. If you're subject to heaven's invitation in any way today, let us know while together we stand and while we sing.